Rosie Rios is a pioneering women's rights advocate, an influential leader in real estate finance, economic development, and urban revitalization. As former treasurer of the United States, appointed by President Obama from 2009 to 2016, she led efforts to place a woman's portrait on US paper currency for the first time in over a century. USA Today has named Rios one of 10 women of the century for the state of Maryland, and she was recently appointed as chair of America 250, the congressional commission charged with planning the nation's 250th anniversary. A graduate of Harvard, Rios is the first Latina in Harvard's history to have a portrait commissioned in her honor. President Yam, faculty, my Maryland family and friends, and especially to you, the graduating students, thank you for this honor. It is great to be home again. I accepted this invitation to give this commencement speech because of what the state of Maryland has meant to me and my family, along with Notre Dame's core values as a Catholic institution. I've had the pleasure of speaking at Notre Dame of Maryland before during my time as Treasurer of the United States. I've also had the opportunity to address the Maryland State Legislature when I led the efforts to place Maryland's very own Harriet Tubman on our $20 bill and my advocacy on why representation matters. And as you've heard, I've had the distinct recognition of being inducted into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. Thank you, Dr. Yam. So you may notice what's been important to me, recognizing historical American women and empowering the next generation of leadership are my two core personal passions. But I didn't necessarily start that way before serving in the Obama administration in 2008. I actually stumbled into what I now call myself as an accidental feminist accidental historian, and accidental educator. So this theme of evolving and growing is very relevant to you over the, these last four years and counting, as has Notre Dame of Maryland over the last two decades, as has the Catholic Church under Pope Francis. The one constant we can always count on is change. And your responsibility is ever evolving in this ever evolving world is how you can embrace it, own it, and advance it to your advantage. Let me start with my own awakening. Over 15 years ago, I was one of about two dozen finance professionals as part of the Treasury Federal Reserve transition team at the height of the financial crisis in the fall of 2008 during one of the most consequential times of our economic history. And it was during this time of heightened stress, I would take my breaks in the Historical Resource Center of Treasury what folks may not know is Treasury was one of the first parts of the federal government formed when George Washington became president in 1789. Treasury didn't just produce currency, they actually produced all the financial products of the federal government, including savings bonds, postage stamps, food stamps. In fact, even today, they still produce the security page of your passport. All of these historical concepts, drawings, and renderings, all of these beautiful products are housed in Treasury's Historical Resource Center, which is not open to the public, and most of which has never been seen by anyone living. But this is where I would take my breaks during the great financial crisis. I would pour through these historical works of art, and after a while, I saw a pattern. Every time I came across the image of a woman, they weren't real women. They were allegorical kind of lady liberty types, sometimes with togas and sometimes without. But every single image that I came across of a man was a real man, a president, a founding father, a cabinet member. Then I dug around a little more and soon realized that the United States of America has never featured the portrait of a woman on its Federal Reserve notes. So think about the value of currency, and it's not just about facilitating commerce. If you go around the world and take a look at currency, international currency, you will see Usually, there's a very important person on the front, and on the back, some type of monument, edifice, event. So this is how we institutionalize our history. And of course, yes, my name is on the lower left-hand side of most of your currency, by the way. 
So if we're missing half of our population in the story of our country, how does this represent our history? And quite frankly, and more importantly, how does this impact the next generation of leadership? I did some additional research, and it turned out that at that time, there are almost 30 countries who had women on their modern day currency, and we weren't one of them. And when I asked the director of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, who would eventually report to me, why this was the case, and I asked the same question of his director and his director. Between the three of them, they had about 100 years at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. I asked them why this has never happened before in the history of our country. Their answer, same answer, independently. No one's ever brought it up. A very, very simple answer to a very complicated question. I do think it, it's a play on unconscious bias. Right? So unconscious bias is when you don't realize that you're being influenced by something you're exposed to. But here's my theory. Could it be that we don't realize that we're being influenced by something we're not exposed to? And the answer is, absolutely. We've all heard the phrase, if you can see it, you can be it. So why is the oldest democracy in the world challenged with representing and honoring over half its population in a way that is generally accepted around the rest of the world in developed nations. It was a very strong epiphany for me. This was December of 2008, and I just could not let it go. I knew that it was up to me to change it. So of the two dozen professionals on the transition team, about half a dozen of us were recommended for a permanent appointment in the Obama administration, and I was one of them. I had a big decision to make. My daughter was eight and my son was 12. Not exactly the best time to move your kids away from California, away from the only friends that they knew, the only home they knew, the only bed that they knew, to this foreign land of Washington, D.C. But I felt an enormous obligation to think beyond ourselves and focus on making this project to feature a woman on our currency a reality. I was nominated by President Obama in May of 2009, confirmed by the Senate in July, and moved my family in August. And I was awakened at the ripe young age of 43 years old. So now that I'm 57 years young, I continue to harness my personal passions of physically honoring historical American women and advocating for women in positions of money and power. And the real irony is that 15 years ago, I would not have ever thought twice about these issues. But it really comes back to this very simple question that I ask myself all the time. We value what we see every day, but do we see what we value. Representation matters. Physical representation matters. So when we made the announcement of Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill almost eight years after my initial awakening, I realized how important that conversation has been across the country and across the globe as the leader of the free world. Perhaps really, we weren't really representing. And to this day of the developed nations, it is still pretty much us in Saudi Arabia who still do not have women on their modern day currency. And so my work continues. Whether my work has included statues, curriculum, congressional gold medals, and most recently, historical American women on our US quarters. Hopefully you've seen them. When the quarter featuring Maya Angelou was released in January of 2022 last year, almost six years after first proposing my legislation, I could not be happier. That quarter represents the first time in the history of our country that an African American has been featured on our coins or currency. <laughs> what decade is this, anyway? That was the same for the Latinx community when Nina Atero Warren's quarter was issued last fall. That was the same for the, American, the Asian Pacific Island community when Anna Mae Wong was featured. I don't think of what I do as a gender initiative. If over half your population is not fully represented, that's an equity issue. We all have skin in this game with our mothers, our daughters, our sisters. If more than half the population is marginalized, this is a future leadership issue, and we were all impacted. And I'm just getting started. We have so much more history to make, but so do you. You were given a great gift that you have earned. My own two children are in your age group, and while it was difficult for all of us to acclimate when we moved to California, choosing to raise my kids in this great state of Maryland during our 10 glorious years here was one of the best journeys we have ever taken. 
Both my kids graduated from Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. My son went off to Harvard, worked for Goldman Sachs, and just got funded to start his own company as a blockchain entrepreneur at 27 years old. My daughter graduated early from the University of California, Davis, and just finished her first year of her doctorate program in psychology in Wisconsin, and couldn't be a happier 22-year-old. Adapting to change was the best thing that ever happened to us, and we would do it all over again with no regrets whatsoever. You have many more peaks to look forward to, but enjoy this one in particular. This is definitely one of the happiest days of your life, and never forget those who made it possible for you to get here, those who invested in you to make you the adult you are today. I am the daughter of immigrants from Mexico, one of nine children raised by a single mother who made sure that education was a ticket to a successful future. Our faith, our Catholic parish, was our village. Our local priests supported us and allowed us to, to have a quality Catholic education. But it was more than just academics. What our community provided us was a strong sense of values, a foundation for how we should be living and how we should be making decisions. And through that foundation of strong values, discipline, and a strong work ethic for all of us, my mother was able to send all nine of us to college. So why are strong values important in a world where values are constantly being tested? Now, I've had the privilege of meeting and working with a lot of smart people, which is important. But ideally, we would have smart people who have a very strong sense of emotional intelligence, the ability to have empathy, respect, and awareness. If the same academically intelligent people also have the same level of emotional intelligence, imagine what the world would be. We would be taking care of our families, especially the future of our children. We would be encouraging the continuation of the melting pot and welcoming people into our country instead of vilifying them. Exactly how the United States came to be united. We are a nation of nations. We would be focused on what binds us, not what divides us. Never has this resonated more with me than when President Biden appointed me last summer as chair of America 250, the Congressional Commission that is planning the nation's 250th anniversary in 2026, just three short years away. We are such a young country with so much more to learn. This three-year journey will be a retrospective, an introspective, and a prospective exercise. I don't think it's an accident that the president would choose someone who is a daughter of immigrants born and raised in Silicon Valley. This is as much about the future as it is the past, and this country is just getting started. Stay tuned for our official public launch this coming 4th of July. And in the meantime, think about where you want to be in 2026. What do you want to accomplish by then personally or professionally? Will you be in graduate school? If you're working, what type of job are you going to have? Where do you want to live? Think of 2026 as a way to make your own pledge of how you envision where you want to be, and more importantly, who you want to be. My pledge for 2026 as Chair of America 250 is to make as many Americans as possible feel like this is the land of opportunity all over again. Think of today as your clean slate to seize your own opportunity. Through this degree, clearly you've invested in yourself, and now it's time to harvest what you have been given. You are enriched not just with the knowledge, but with diversity of thought, and you should never forget that is your best asset. Harness your values and never waver from your conviction. Obviously, I did not. You as the next generation of leadership are so promising. You are a generation that hopefully will focus on people first and foremost. If you look at a profile of what you believe in, you are more passionate, purpose-driven, and less likely to think about identity politics as my generation. Find a way to channel that passion and purpose and do something that transforms everything that you touch. Take strategic risks and be empowered to execute your ideas. This is the first time when we find those teachable moments and own them to inspire you to take those next steps. Embrace your fears and walk through the fire with courage. Those scars will serve you well. And when you have your low points, and we all have them, know that this too will pass. And remember that what is going to separate you from others is your ability to connect on a human level. 
always remember that human capital is the best investment that you will ever make. Be bold, be empowered, and most of all, be yourself. Congratulations to all of you, and thank you again for this honor.